Hi guys, uh, welcome to our talk. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, so we're going to be talking about mobility insights and how we try to understand locations inside of Switzerland and how we try to understand locations, especially to people who move through them. You'll find on the slide up there a couple of uh, places where you can reach us. Don't hesitate to do so. But I would need to mention that this is a presentation on the work of a team of uh, more than 10 people throughout the years. And we're only responsible personally for a small part of that. Now, we're going to go through a small intro about what you can do with positioning in the modern phone, net phone network, and then I'll go on to explain our concept of smart data, which is what we do with that opportunity. Um, I'll go under the hood and show you what we are doing with uh, our big data architecture, and then we'll delve into the actual machine learning, starting with trajectory classi classification, um, which is one of our batch approaches, and then streaming to try to understand what's going on with Swiss highways. And then I'll ask you, I'll, I'll tell you about some of the things that are still a challenge for us and for which we're eager to actually get your collaboration, which means this is the time to perk up. And if you know cool stuff about the challenges I'm going to be presenting, please feel free to connect with us. So if you have a mobile phone network, any mobile phone network here in Brussels, in France, in Switzerland, in the US, Here's what you get. You don't have the ability to do triangulation at scale, which is one of the things that surprised me when I joined a telco company for the first time in my career, which is that when you have a radio emitter, such as a cell phone, you could theoretically do triangulation, but you need special radio emitters for that. They are not deployed at scale within each of your antennas. Um, so while that might work, might work for positioning one person, it's not what something you can do to get an idea of where people are. What you do have, however, is uh, an, event, an event stream of cell attachment events. And by studying that event stream, you can already get some, some rough positioning with a precision of around 200 meters on average. That's on average, and in Switzerland, where remember is a heck of a lot of mountains. Now, that's in general, if you are looking at specific barrier and locations, and if you're looking at cell-to-cell uh, -cell transitions, when the cell phone is active, there's a specific uh, event there that occurs that's a handover, and this massively reduces the, uh, um, the uh, augments the precision of, the, of our positioning, where the error go goes down to 50 meters. And then if you have exceptional modern data sources that include time in advance, that's ELTE, CTR, or GPE, depending on whether you're on 4G or 3G, you can get even better results with a, a piece of data called timing advance, which gives you an idea of the, the time to do a round trip from the antenna to the uh, user equipment back to the antenna. Um, so out of that ability has grown uh, a cottage industry around the idea of trajectory data mining, which was originally research that was based on GPS data, and that now we, we, we can do, if we do time series reconstruction um, from the various data sources that are relatively complex to acquire on a modern phone network. So you get data from 2G, 3G, 4G networks that all are slightly different, but if you're able to reconstruct them into a single data source, um, you can start having events that kind of make sense, then you start segmenting that into static and mobile periods to have an idea of when the user equipment is moving or not. And if you get that, you can even elaborate that notion to even more um, um, semantics onto uh, that time series where you start reconstructing a trajectory with techniques such as map mat matching, etc. And you might even want to do mode of transport detection to have an idea of what was used to, to go across that trajectory. Uh, here, a small bike. And uh, where the U UE was coming from, let's say the home, and where the UE was going, let's say work. And that could possibly be a commuting, tra a commuting trip. Now, I'm going to talk about how, so, so far that has been uh, how to do positioning with a mobile phone network, any mobile phone network, French, English, whatever. Um, and I'm going to talk about what we do with the opportunity of doing that positioning at Swisscom. And it's going to be a twofold answer. One part of that answer is going to be super aggressive on how we do that really, really well with super competitive analytics and the best data sources. And that's going to be part of the answer, yes, but I don't want you to forget the second part of the answer, which is a much softer one, which is making sure that the design of doing this embodies the right values. 
which is my cue to introduce our concept of smart data, starting with the elephant in the room, which is that we don't track any users. I'll just read this quote. Swisscom strictly complies with all applicable legislations, in particular with the teleco data, teleco telecommunications law and the data protection initiative, which, if you know the legal context of Switzerland, it means that you are within one of the most constraining privacy concerned legal environments in the world. The only ones that could maybe uh, do competition with, with us would be Germany, maybe. Um, and we're really happy about that because we think that privacy preservation is an asset. It makes the, the, the so it's, it's something that we transfer also to our technical code where we make sure that we only answer synoptic questions uh, about distributions and how big groups of people move. Uh, it's something that we do, do paying attention to, of course, anonymization, but beyond that, data flow control, where we know that some of an the anonymized data could possibly still contain personal tracks, and we make sure to destroy those, and we neutralize those quasi-identifiers at every stage. But most of all, the gist of it that I would want you to retain is that it just makes sense. It's just good business to care as much as your customer as they care about you. And the proof is in the pudding, because I apologize for the, the labels of that graph being in French, but all you have to notice is that the big bar at the bottom is that of Swisscom. That there is, um, uh, Swisscom has a market share which wouldn't be uh, a miss in an election report by in the Soviet era. And uh, it's basically the only significant market share that is growing. So when you have customers that care that much about you, considering that on top of that Swisscom has top tier pricing, it makes sense to care as much about them. Hence our choices. We've been focusing on public good applications, making Switzerland run better so that our customers can see return on investment on joining us. We always want to understand places, never individuals, and we refu refuse to do so. And we work only on anonymized aggregations that are di results about distributions of people, and trying that reflect how places work, we really don't care about individuals. So that we've been developing a first product um, among the, the series of products that work on um, um, the, the verticals that help people understand their own particular locations, things, events, tourism, those, those segments. Our first product is for urban planners that are trying to figure out where to put their next road, where to put their next transport, uh, where to put their next parking lot. And to sh you have at the bottom a uh, quote by a very satisfied customer that we really like very much. Um, and to show you how that product works, I'll let, I'll let Mohamed give you an idea of what that looks like. OK. Do you hear me? OK. Thank you, Francois. So as Francois said, City is our first product. And um, so our customer will be public institution, municipality, and more precisely, urban planners. So imagine you're an urban planner in the city of Montreux, which is in Switzerland. So you choose your area, then you can have actually all the information about the mobility within a given area. So you can have uh, um, the volume of trips that we see in the, in the bottom. Actually, let me take a look. Let's say we, we, we are interested in the period between 15th of June and 15th of July. Okay. And then you can see the, the, the volume of trips observed in the city. You can see also different trip types. So you can you're interested perhaps in the proportion of inward trips versus the proportion of transit. And usually urban plans are interested in the volume of transit in order to know if it should be minimized or is it like reasonable. Then we can see um, <coughs> the mode of transport and we can see like for each day of the period the volume of trips uh, is seen. So here we see like the urban planners will notice that uh, from Friday, 1st of July, there is an increase in the volume of trips. And he will understand because he lives in Montreux and you know there is the Montreux Jazz Festival. So there is uh, many, many uh, people coming to Montreux. And then you can say there is a peak uh, at Saturday on 9th of July. You can also have the, the hourly profile for that. So by hour of the day. So imagine uh, urban planners are interested in inward trips. Okay, so people coming to Montreux to stay, so not transit. So he can have a distribution, a geographical distribution of the origins in Switzerland. And then he can, this allows actually to have a better understanding of what, what's happening actually in the mobility level. And then they can also filter by mean of transport 
uh, train and something and other means of transport, but this we will elaborate on that later on. So I guess we need to come back. Okay. So, so you use it very quickly. I mean, this is typically allows urban planners and uh, and um, political like municipalities to to take data-driven decisions that are in, involves projects of millions of Swiss francs. And I think it's for them it's very right, it's very important to take the right decision based on on uh, insights, not n not in intuitions. So let me talk about the big data architecture we have behind the city product. So it's very classic, actually. We, so we have a flow of network events coming to our Kafka cluster, and then we have Spark at the heart of uh, our computations. Uh, we have a mix of uh, streaming and batch uh, jobs, of course, and the idea is that we need really... What we do uh, um, daily is basically compute features out of the network traces and trying to get uh, aggregates about mobilities and basically, once we get the aggregates, we push them to Cassandra and Elastic. And then we, have, we expose this result through uh, uh, APIs, typically implemented in Spray or front-end uh, uh, front uh, portal, actually web portal, where can basically urban planners can go and, and see what happens. OK, very quickly, some Spark configuration essential for enterprise job. Um, definitely increasing the memory of the executors. Uh, because usually we can do that because at the cluster we have more powerful machines. Having a Cray registrator because it's much faster, enabling shuffling and dynamic allocation in order to balance uh, the resources we have within the cluster. This is important both for streaming and for batch mode because this actually uh, alleviates the dependency of the streaming job on the initial allocation. Uh, and there to remove single point of failure, we can, we, you can use Zookeeper uh, to, um, for the recovery mode. More, actually, more pointers. There is a pointer here, a book that you can have a look at, and then, of course, a third pointer is Francois. You can ask him about that. He's very knowledgeable about that. <coughs> actually, the glue that holds everything together in our infrastructure is basically Scala. Scala is really at the heart of, of what we do, and it's a very... Um, it's functional, it's a very, uh, it has a nice type inference. It's, uh, it's actually, we enjoy using it every day. And here, in a few lines of code, we will just show you how we can uh, encode uh, powerful concepts uh, in a very, very few lines of code. So usually what we deal with is like uh, timestamp sequences of events. And here what we do is basically we can declare two types. We say, okay, there is a type that is chronological, so basically ordered from the least recent to the most recent, and anti-chronological is the opposite. And what we do is basically our method expect either one type or the other, and here, by declaring an implicit class chrono, we can um, actually convert implicitly from one type to the other. And this is really in two, we just have to define two implicit functions, reverse chrono or reverse anti-chrono, that will take basically one type and convert it to the other if needed. You can see, yeah, exactly. It's as easy as that. It's basically, as it's expecting a sorted uh, list, it's just a reverse, so it's, uh, it's not costly at all, versus other the approach where you have to sort each time uh, your list when you have it as an input. <coughs> trajectory classification. So here, actually, one of the, so we have directed with the many urban planners to try to understand what are their needs, actually, and what do they want to understand. And one critical point, actually, we see is when they have flows or trips, they want to distinguish between trains and other means of transport. Okay? And uh, here it's typically like a classification problem where what we have as an input uh, a sequence of network events, so a network trace. Basically, you have timestamp time sequence of network events. And what we have to, uh, what you want as an output is basically a class. Is it a train or not? <coughs> and the idea here was really to say, okay, can we uh, have such a classifier by creating fingerprints of cells. Because intuitively what we expect is that cells that are, like, let's say, associated or close to railway stations have, uh, will have a very typical time series. So that those time series will be... Uh, so if you look at the number of connections versus time, this uh, time series will be characterized by intermittent increase in the number of connections. So basically a train passes by and you have a, a peak in the number of connections that drops very quickly. For that, what we need, I will show you just an example, actually, of a, of a bursty cell. 
So basically, this we are x-axis is the minute of the day, and y-axis is the number of connections. And here we see that most of the time the number of connections is zero or very low, and then we have bursts. So like bursts in the number of connections, and this is really associated like to people passing by in a train. So can we use that actually in order to have a classifier, uh, accurate classifier, in order to capture this burstiness and the peak, sudden peak in, in the number of connections? What we do is we basically we uh, we compute the burstiness. It's also called final factors in some other uh, fields. And basically, if you have a random process with a mean u and a variance sigma square, the relative you compute the relative var uh, variance, which is sigma square by u. Okay. And this, if we have a very bursty process, should be very high. Whereas if you have a non-bursty process, it should be very low. What we do now? So what we have, as I said, we want to capture fingerprint of cells. Okay. So we have periodic sparse jobs to do that uh, in a regular manner. And then we have a supervised uh, training on labeled data. So how do you get labeled data? Actually, Swisscom has some uh, fleet of, uh, of cars and trains going through the city. And then we can use these traces. Of course, for those traces, we have the label, because you know it's a train or it's a car. And then we can use that in order to train our classifier. And of course, we train and test with Spark ML. Uh, very quickly to show you how easy is it for us to move from the feature to a training classifier and then to predict. So have we, have, uh, we have our data, which is basically a transport mode and uh, features. And then from that, we create uh, basically RDD of labeled points. We cache them, and then we define the functions that allow us basically to train our model. Here I showed an example of a very simple logistic regression. And we set the number of class, we set the intercept to be true. And then what we do is basically... Um, we train simply our model on the, the labeled data we have, and then we try to predict and compute the test error and that. And then finally, we train, once we have an estimation of the accuracy on the test set, we train the, the model on the whole data sets in order not to lose any sample. Okay. So uh, I've, been, I've been really happy to, to be able to show slides in Scala um, because while we wanted to insist on how Scala was more than a language that is concise, in which we've seen you that with this way of dealing with chronological and anti-chronological lists, we were eliminating entire classes of bugs using the type system. It's also nice to be able to tout the simple advantages of Scala, which is, hi, we can put it on a slide. It's that concise. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, some uh, streaming analytics that we do in real time to try to understand highways. And it's a relatively simple application. You have a segment of highway you would like to try to find in real near real time uh, the speed of cars that are flowing through that highway. Is there a traffic jam occurring? Is there going to be a traffic jam occurring? Can you do traffic simulation, understand what types of car you can see on that segment? All of that. And um, the one of the challenges that we've seen <coughs> is understanding deeply the computation model of Spark, and that's maybe the, one of the, the, the most um, transmissible um, insights I can, I can give you, even if you're not doing anything related to highways. It's the idea that if you are processing that with Spark streaming, and we do work with Spark streaming, it helps with a Lambda architecture that feeds itself off of features like burstiness that we compute out of the network. But what we're trying to do with, with, with highways is really understanding uh, the real-time behavior using Spark Streaming. And we do have that, that batch interval that exists like in each job, and that you should really envision as a computation budget. The idea being that at every batch interval, you need to provide an answer for whatever analytics you're doing. And uh, that computation budget is the amount of time you have. In my case, it was 150 seconds. So you see that it's near real-time, not complete real time, but um, in every 150 seconds, I need to provide a result, right? And the challenge is the following, that uh, when we receive data, or the fire hose of data that comes from the Swisscom network, we receive at any given point in the day a minimum of two or three million um, individuals or, let's say, equipments generating events. And the number of users that are on the network of our highways of interest is just a few thousand which is way less than, than that huge number. So we would have had two, two ways of defining a pipeline, either the progressive filtering in which we look at every single trace and then we try to figure out if that guy is maybe on the highway, maybe not on the highway, then compute his speed, and then finally drop it if it's not really interesting. Or we could do something like early filtering. We were looking for a way to guess really, really, really quickly if uh, the particular trace 
trace or particular equipment had the chance of being anywhere near a highway. And for us, the solution was graph matching. And it was graph matching on the abstract sense. It's not a usage of graphics. It's really fundamentally looking at the fact that we know those highways. We know which set of cell associations you should make so that we can construct a graph where the vertexes are actually cell towers of the network. And we expect to know which ones you're going to hit within, in the order. Exactly. Now, that graph is a little bit ambiguous because if you drive a little bit on the left or a little bit on the right of the highway, you may not hit the same cell. And more importantly, um, we might, the, the network is constantly evolving. We're constantly installing new cells, constantly shutting down old ones. And you might have a trajectory in the green, gray here where you hit a cell that we've never seen before. And for us, the, uh, uh, the key discovery was locality sensitive hashing. It's that, that family of hash functions that basically collisions if the original uh, values that you pass to those hash functions have been. Um, are close to each other, but not necessarily completely equal. So we have a package for that that we hope to release open source very quickly and at least before, before the end of the year. There's a number of other references on how to do that on Spark, and Uber has been doing interesting work uh, parallel to our own um, uh, in, with Spark. And that let us do that very early filtering that reduced our computation from a big number of users to a very small number very quickly. Now, that was really essential because when you, once you have determined that a trace is probably near a highway, you need to actually compute what, the speeds you, what speeds you could extract from that trace, right? And it turns out that cell associations are not really enough for that. To get a speed, you need to position a user two times, right? You have an idea of the difference in time, and if you have positioned him, you have an idea of the difference in distance. Distance over time gives you speed. So far, seems good, except we have umbrella cells or what we call umbrella cells, which is what you see on the left here. Those are usually far and wide-ranging cells that are there to cover a very, very large seg segment of, of geographical locations, a very large range. And um, those are only able to accept a certain load. Those are low population areas. So what do you do if you have a village in the middle of that wide range? What do you do if you have a shopping center? What do you do if you have a train station? Well, you install a small cell, which is there to offload the load that you're going to get, those bursts that you're going to get out of that train station, out of that, that mall uh, or shopping center. And this is really interesting to us because that umbrella doesn't give us uh, a positioning. It's only by looking at the succession of events where we see, yes, an attachment to the umbrella cell, but then an attachment to a much smaller cell that we can get an approximate positioning for a user. Same thing on the right. If you figure out that the user is on the upper part, you can then probably figure out which region of the last part at the fork he was exactly in. He probably took the road that was going from his point of view to the left to get to the upper part of the road. And getting that better positioning is actually uh, done algorithmically, mechanically. I've explained the intuition, but through uh, segmenting of the highway this time, we cut the highway in small blocks. And then we get another graph, which is a reachability analysis of in between those, those little segments. And we are constantly querying that graph for paths in the graph. Can you go from here to there? Can you go from there to here? And that query is linear, and you need to do it every time for every user. Um, and doing that for every user means that we have globally a quadratic algorithm, which works really well when you have a thousand users, but doesn't work when you have millions of users. Hence the importance of our very early filtering in our algorithm. And the last advice I'd like to leave you with when you think of the batch interval as a computation a budget is to take into account checkpointing. Checkpointing by default occurs um, every multiple of the batch interval that is larger than 10 seconds, which means that you might, if you don't change the default interval for checkpointing, you might be checkpointing too often. What that gives you graphically is what you see on the graph above, where all those small spikes occurring at very rapid intervals are probably in the checkpointing interval that has not been changed from the default. You are checkpointing all the time.
Now, the problem with checkpointing is that you are writing to disk or you're writing to somewhere, and that somewhere may be relatively slow, which means that every k batches, if you checkpoint every k batches, you will need p batches to recover from the time, the computing time that out of your budget that you've spent checkpointing and writing to some kind of centralized data source. You'd better make sure that k is larger than p, otherwise your job is going to go unstable. If you go above budget with Spark Streaming, the result is, in general, instability. OK. Now, that was st streaming real time. Let's have a look at the data challenges, what is still a, a big problem for us. Some of those are problems that are, that are, are um, not necessarily for you, but it's something that should be a point of interest for your use case, which is uh, the quality and reliability of data sources. I've told you about timing advance that, lets you, that gives us a quantum leap in precision that lets us go from, oh yes, that user equipment is in this village, to, oh, uh, is, is the user equipment is in this village and it's actually in front of the church. Um, so those data sources uh, need to flow in very, very reliably because the moment they go off, the precision of that you, in of the insights that you are able to deliver are, is, becomes absolutely uh, disappears, in fact. And Spark is a highly resi resilient framework, but you might want to have a very, very close look at what occurs before Spark. Kafka is still resilient, but what feeds Kafka? And in, in a large-scale enterprise world, that's actually extremely difficult to, uh, to achieve, and you really want to pay attention to that part. One thing that is more related to the data science and the machine learning we do every day is the ground truth checking. We like to have a feed of things that come in and tell us if our models are relatively good or not. That lets you access to really, really cheap algorithms uh, of the class of supervised training. Now, in the highway, there's already sensors that compute nearly everything that we're doing. There's uh, plate readers, there's pressure sensors. There's a number of things that, go, that come in and that we, we, we can have a relative access to if we ask nicely. We also have what Mohammed told you about, what's called the Thames fleet, which are professional cars um, from, from Swisscom and then professional boxes that are in trains and that come in with a SIM card and a GPS. So we have the attachment event coming from the SIM card and we have the position coming from the GPS. That's great. But it doesn't give you the, the ground truth for non-train mode of transport detection. What, how do you detect a bike? How do you detect the ground truth for a bike? How do you understand what's a domicile? What's the work location? And to do that, we don't want to look at any of our traces. We don't want to join our data sets with a customer file, with something like that, to, uh, to obtain anything that could harm the privacy of our customers. Um, so what we do is that we have colleagues and friends, and I really mean colleagues sitting right next to me, that volunteer that their data traces for a few hours. They tell us, oh, uh, you can look at my 9 to 12 where I've done a train trip from Zurich to come to the office. And those serve as, as a little bit of ground truth, but of course it's highly biased. So that we're looking at precise situations where people don't have an expectation of privacy and where they would let us, of course with us asking in advance, look at their phone trace thinking that, yeah, no, it's actually beneficial. And we're looking at things such as the outdoors world and the races and athleticism world, where if you're running a race, you don't have an expectation of privacy, of course, because, well, your, your participation to the race is public. Your times in the race are actually public as well. So you know that uh, you're going to be, to, to be uh, running a very, very set trajectory. And when, then we try to find benefits and value for um, those, uh, those runners to uh, let us look at their traces to try to understand the mode of transport that is, after all, the closest to walking, which is running, walking a little bit fast. Um, so if you know of uh, mobility behaviors like this, where people don't, are absolutely not creeped out when you look at them in advance, can I look at what you've been, what you've been doing, how you've been moving, uh, feel free to, to contact us. We're really eager to, to make that work in a way that works for the people contributing the data, which are, which are the customers. Thank you very much, and we'll be able to open this for questions. Uh, 
Oh, we have one question there. Can I give him the... Um, so my question is about uh, privacy. Yeah. Um, so you have to track uh, a user with an ID uh, from one location to another. Uh, and you have the customer data uh, on one side of your system and uh, um, the user ID on the other side of your system. So yeah. how do you ensure that no one can go back from uh, the ID that's in the inside uh, to the actual customer data? Role based. So first, um, the nice thing about having a big organization is that it's entirely different divisions that manage those systems. So we make sure that the only uh, toll between those people is offline and at the water cooler. Um, so we don't exchange bits with those guys first. But the second, the larger framework is role-based access control, and we work on, on anonymized streams ourselves, which means that um, even if we want it, all of our, the identifiers that we have are hashed in a way that cannot be a key uh, with the, the, customer, the customer data, right? So even if we were exchanging bigs, and in particular, even if we were, let's say, hacked, God forbid, we have also teams that are working really, really hard so that we're not hacked, of course. Again, big enterprise, we do things professionally. But um, there's the, the, um, even, even if we were, all you would find are hashes. Uh, there's a very limited of people that know how to reproduce those, ha set of people that know how to reproduce those hashes. I'm not one of them, Mohammed isn't either. Uh, which means that we, we can't uh, join that ac across the primary key of our customer table. Now, on top of that, we are looking, um, we know that anonymization is not enough, so we are looking at uh, countering re-identification, we are looking at differential privacy, we are looking at methods to add noise to the, to the data, we are looking very seriously at making sure that no re-identification ever happens. So three steps. First, we don't exchange bit, bits with those people. Three seconds, even if we did, all of that is hashed. Um, and there's no primary key to join with their, the customer file. Third, we're looking at even more advanced methods to add noise to the data so that this, this doesn't l reveal any particular private behavior. <coughs> okay, that's all the time we have for questions. Um, so thanks very much. I'm sure if you have more questions, they can handle that in the back of the room. Thank you.